So, uh, as we said last week, uh, this is our second week, uh, the reason we're doing this class is we, uh, we're in a particular moment in our nation's history where polarization is, is very high. Um, the rhetoric, there's a lot of fire and a lot of heat and not, a, not always a lot of light. Um, and so, because we, we are a large church, um, we have all sorts of different political opinions expressed. I actually think that's, that's a, a, a sign of health in our church. Um, it's also a sign of, of having both an urban and a rural kind of culture in Charlottesville. It's a sign of a lot of things. But, but one thing that we want to do is make sure that we are thinking biblically uh, and thoughtfully, theologically about politics. Um, not that we're thinking partisan, but that, that we're thinking um, biblically about how do we even begin to approach politics. So, so last week we began on a, uh, on a note of liberty of conscience, um, that, that things about th things regarding the politics, the Bible, there are all sorts of different governments in the Bible. Uh, there's not one preference given to, an, to one or the other, and God's people have lived in a variety of different contexts. Um, and so we are, Scripture gives us principles, um, but we, we have Christian freedom when it comes to how we order, how we participate in, in, in the temporal kingdom and in, in government. So we, we ended on liberty of conscience. This week, we're going to be talking about the news. Uh, I've titled this uh, Heavenly Wisdom and Earthly News. Um, so... So one of the things I feel like very closely tied into politics is, is news media, um, which, is, which gives us a constant stream about, about politics. So this week we're going to be trying to think through how do we engage wisely with the news. And then uh, next week uh, we'll be going into uh, a political church. What does it mean the church is political? Should the church be political? How should it not be? So that's just a little orientation there. So as we, as we talked about last week, the conscience, uh, everything that, that we say today, I want you to have in mind, that's kind of the first word. Uh, I can't tell you what news to listen to or, or how much news to listen to. That's not my role, nor do I want to, to do that. Uh, that is, that is, that is uh, up to you and the spirit who leads you. Um, but however, what we're going to be doing is looking at some principles for how we should discern what news we should listen to or, or engage in or how much. So we're, we're going for the principle. Obviously the Bible doesn't have, in the Bible times, there wasn't CNN or MSNBC or Fox News, and so you don't have that. But, but there are still absolutely relevant um, principles that, that I hope we can unpack today. So um, that's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end that right there. I, I hope that that sort of principle well, it's going to set us up for some more pr principles for politics uh, in later classes. But that's, that's kind of the overview of today. Thank you for that introduction, Jesse. And as we begin to dig into this topic of um, media, could you give us a little bit of a working definition of what we mean by media or news media and perhaps some history of how we've arrived at the current reality of news media today? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So when I think about the news media, kind of the, it very much is a modern invention. Uh, you, need, you, need, uh, you need a medium of, of mass communication, which begins with the printing press, uh, and it became much cheaper to, to print. And so you have newspapers beginning uh, in the 17th century, uh, and, and almost right off from the bat, one of the things I love about history is that it definitely rhymes. It doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it definitely rhymes. And so, um, and there was a London periodical in the 1730s called the Grub Street Journal. The Grub Street Journal. And what the Grub Street Journal did was print uh, conflicting reports in the other newspapers and it would it would run them side by side um, and it actually became a very popular uh, newspaper um, and uh, another kind of repeat of history fake fake news has been around for at least a century uh, Merriam Webster traces uh, fake news back to the 1890s which was 
kind of the heyday of American newspaper men um, with William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. Um, and they were experimenting with the new urbanism. There were, there were huge cities, and so newspapers became uh, quite, quite large. And they, they would call uh, what they would do yellow journalism, which was this kind of sensationalized reporting to drive up sales of the newspapers. And uh, this yellow journalism would, would focus on gossip, sex, divorce. It would even have faked, faked news, fake interviews. Thomas Edison once complained that all the interviews in the newspapers, he had never done any of them. Thomas Edison, the, the famous inventor, so, so fake news has been around uh, at least since the newspapers have been. Well, but when, when we think about media, though, we also think about television. Television, radio, uh, all of those were, are part of, part of the news media. And the one thing that's really important for us to understand our context is that the federal, uh, the FCC, the federal regulatory board that, that regulates the radio and TV, they actually put in a, a doctrine called the Fairness Doctrine in the, in the mid, mid 20th century. And the Fairness Doctrine required uh, adequate coverage of public issues. And also they made sure that coverage would fairly represent opposing views. So, um, so if you gave kind of the, the right side of things, you would also need to give the left side of things. Um, now that was that governed. I think American media tended to still be a little bit left, a little bit liberal, um, but it was actually repealed in the late Reagan administration. Um, I actually share a birthday. It was repealed on my birthday, August fifth, nineteen eighty-seven, the day I was born. Uh, it was repealed on First Amendment issues. Um, that that that. That was curtailing people's free speech, and so they took out the fairness doctrine. And that's when you see, I mean, Rush Limbaugh was one of the first to, to, to really capitalize on that. And so, so, so you, have, you have the birth of Fox News uh, in the early 90s, or in the mid-90s with Roger Ailes. Uh, you have MSNBC. Uh, and now, now let's jump to the last piece, which is uh, the internet, which has blown up our news, right? We have social media, um, we have uh, a website. Not only do we have 24-7 news running on networks, we also can just dial in and, and look up whatever we want. Um, and so I think that's, a, that's, and not only that, but it's now tied into our social networks, uh, our social media like Facebook. Uh, many people get their news from Facebook, from Twitter, uh, from Reddit, and so, uh, and that adds another complication. Not only if, if news media became, became partisan back in the, in the late 80s, now it, it can actually be very specialized to you, to just you, because the internet is smart and it's learning your, by algorithms. It can learn what you have been looking at. There's a, there's a great documentary that I recommend everyone watch called uh, The Social Dilemma. And the social dilemma is about how social media is contributing to polarization. That, that if you uh, look at conservative, if, if you tend to be conservative, your Facebook or your social media is gonna, con gonna tend to give you conservative stories that are just gonna, gonna continue to kind of press into your, uh, your biases. And the same with liberal. Um, you can actually type in, uh, Google, Google is not neutral, if you type in Climate change is whatever Google says after that is based on your region. It's based on the city you live. It's based on your history. Um, climate change is a hoax. Climate change is real. It all depends on where you're actually living and what you've actually put in. So I think social social uh, yeah social media has just blown up our our. Um, our news and how we do new news. So, Darcy, I want to belabor this point a little bit because what you're describing is across all these platforms, radio, uh, more so now TV, uh, print, publication, internet, we have a news media machine that is essentially telling us uh, either what we want to hear or expect to hear or um, 
these media sources are also providing the sort of content that is provocative or controversial in some way. Could you speak a little bit more about, again, what are some of the principles you think current news media are using? What are their incentives or goals in terms of how they might be offering news in particular yeah. uh, biases? There's, there's a great little book uh, called How the News Makes Us Dumb. How the News Makes Us Dumb, The Death of Wisdom in an Information Society. What's so amazing about this book is that it was written pre-internet. <laughs> it was written in 1999 by a Christian historian. And one of the things he's, he unpacks in that is how the news seeks to be addictive. It wants, it wants you to depend on it, um, to come to it. And, and par partly the reason why is because advertising, advertising is how the news makes money. Uh, and so the more the more that they can get uh, raise their circulation with your newspaper, the more they can have your TV on, the more they can have the clicks, the more money they make. I think it's really important that we understand that maybe we remember that that these news corporations are are they are corporations, they're businesses, they're trying to make money. And so advertising is the primary where Way that they do that, and so that's that's partly why we've seen a rise of partisan, um, is because there's a market for it, uh, and each of them are, are trying to make a, a bottom dollar there. Um, what's really intriguing to me is that even though even though the Washington Post and New York Times have been so kind of adversarial with Donald Trump, their circulations and subscriptions are just are skyrocketing right now. And so even that Trump has been really good business for them um, because, because people are going to the news. And it's kind of this funny mutualistic relationship that they're both adversarial and yet they give Trump kind of headlines and Trump uh, is driving up their, their, uh, their sales. And so I think it's important to remember that these are businesses. And I, I would like to, to, to believe that they are in it for the truth but I think that often profit and power are also just right there among the truth as a, as a, a yeah, because they're humans like us, so. So as we seek to be um, informed about the world and our own neighborhoods, and particularly in this political season, as we also want to try to be responsible voters in whatever ways uh, we know how, if it's the case that our news media might not be able to be sort of swallowed whole scale if we need to be wise and discerning consumers. How do we begin to think biblically about our own consumption of the news and how we understand its impact on us? Yeah. So, so because we're going through James, I really want to use James as a jumping point here. Uh, so I want to look at James 3, uh, verse 13 through 18, which I think Lane, can you uh, put that in the chat? James 3, or if you have a Bible, that's even better. Um, a real artifact. Uh, James 3, 13 through 18. So James says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So I just want to take some, what, what might James had to say? What might James had to say about the news? One of the things that I, I, I really love how this begins, and by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So let's just take that last phrase, the meekness of wisdom. That there is something profoundly, that wisdom is profoundly humble for us. There's, there's, that wisdom is knowing your place and where you stand in the air. 
in, uh, in the earth in regards to God. I think of uh, Proverbs, beginning wisdom with the fear of the Lord. And one of the things that I think, there, there's this kind of presupposition, I think, to, to the news, a sort of assumption in the news, that we can know it all, that we can actually be informed, uh, that we can be informed. And I think when you think about that, when you begin to tease that out, there are always limits to how much we are informed. I mean, you, that's, you, what does it really mean to be informed? Um, is it, does that mean reading five newspapers? Or does that mean reading all the blogs? There's a kind of, and, and what is that? Can you actually be informed about everything? Um, no, you can't. You can't. Even, even try to get my head around like, one country and one like one season in our country is just so and i don't think we're meant to right there's this meekness like i, I think about the the doctrine of omniscience that that god is all-knowing and we are not and i think that there's this kind of presumption that often just creeps into news as if as if we really know what's going on as if we can really know what's going on and sometimes we can Sometimes we can, but there's just this humility. There's this that, that, that we are not omniscient. And there's this approach to wisdom that, that realizes that there are limits to our knowledge. And that's good. That's good. That's actually being a creature. Um, and so I think, I think about, uh, and that, that makes me think of 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul says, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. I, when, when, when I listen to, to, to the news, whether it's, it's the right or left or trying to be moderate, we, I have to remember that the wisdom of this world, regardless, is still, is still folly, with, with folly compared to, to the Lord. And so I think... I, I just love that, the meekness of wisdom. What does it mean to approach the news in humility and to realize that, that I can be misled, that you can be misled, that everyone can be misled? That's part of being a human is this, this frailty. But God, only God, is the one who can be trusted completely um, to, give us, to give us the whole story. Um, so I think... I think that's one, that's one principle um, when I think about James. I, I also love this next verse, verse 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, um, I think I, when I look at the competition between the news organizations, I think I see a lot of bitter jealousy and a lot of selfish ambition. Um, there's all this promotion of who's going to get the ratings, who's doing well. Um, and then it says, do not boast, be false to the truth. Um, be false to the truth. That's another place where God has a lot to say about the truth, right? That, that God is a God of truth and cares deeply about the truth. In fact, when I think about the, the news media and I think about just concrete things, I, I, I love the, the, the ninth commandment, the ninth commandment and the ten commandments. God said, do not bear false witness. Do not bear false witness. If I think there's any sort of chief sin of American politics and the media, I think that bearing false witness is probably chief among them. Um, this bearing false witness. Um, Can you give us an example of what you mean by that? Yeah, sure. I, this is actually one quite, quite close to home, I, I, I've noticed. So right after the, the August 12th, 2017 riots in Charlottesville, Donald Trump had, uh, President Trump had a, a press conference. And um, in that press conference, he said there were good people on both sides, good people on both sides. He then went on to qualify that by saying, I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis. I'm not talking about white supremacists. What he was really talking about on the, was, was the people who really appreciate their Southern heritage and were there to, to, to defend the, the statues, the Lee statue um, and uh, the Jackson statue. But, but what the media did was it just gave a little sound clip of there were good people on both. They didn't have the qualification that, that, that President Trump added in. It was just there were good people on both sides. 
Um, and I'm not defending Trump. I'm not defending anyone. I'm just saying I think this is where we see a bearing false witness. What's really interesting is that actually Joe Biden and his in his lead up in the very first ad when he declared he was running for president, he had a clip of the Charlottesville riots, and he said so clearly. He quoted Trump. He said, uh, "Good people on both sides. Good people on both sides." So, so both the media and, and uh, other politicians are taking just this one thing uh, that's bearing false witness. That's bearing false, false witness. Um, one of the things I love about our tradition is the Westminster Larger Catechism has this beautiful exposition on all the things that it means to bear false witness. Um, it says, I want to just read a couple, couple clips from there. It says, the ninth commandment requires that we maintain and promote truthfulness in our dealings with each other and the good reputation of others as well as ourselves. We must come forward and stand up for the truth, speaking the truth and nothing but the truth from our hearts, sincerely, freely, clearly, and without equivocation. And then it says, the ninth commandment forbids everything detrimental to the truth and the good reputation of others as well as our own. It says, forgery is forbidden, as is concealing the truth, remaining silent in a just cause, and not taking it on ourselves to reprove or complain to others about some wrong. We must not speak the truth at an inappropriate time, or maliciously to promote a wrong purpose, nor pervert it into a wrong meaning. Into a wrong meaning. I think that's what we saw with the, the, the both sides comment. Um, also forbidden or saying anything untrue, lying, slandering, backbiting, belittling, gossiping, ridiculing, reviling, or expressing any kind of judgmental opinion that is rash, harsh, or prejudiced. <laughs> uh, I just, I mean, I don't know about you, but as soon as I begin to read that, I, I, I'm nailed. It nails me. I mean, I, I broke the, I broke the ninth commandment just today several times. But I think if our, if our news media. And our politics actually took the Ninth Commandment seriously. I think that we'd have a very different kind of politics and a very different kind of media. So as we consider that um, media sources might have their internal principles in terms of increasing readership and perhaps um, selling well, which often depends on scandal or controversy um, manipulating the truth or perhaps saying part of that. I think, I think there's good reason to consider how media sources across all sides of the spectrum, left, right, and center might fall prey to that. Help us begin to think about how we're meant to sort of self-diagnose um, what it means for us to be faithful disciples. Um, how do we make sense of how we are being formed? Yeah. We're not in Christ likeness. You, you mentioned the Westminster Catechism. Using that language or going back to the James passage, can you help us uh, yeah. think practically about how we're being formed? Yeah. So I, I, I love, I, I want to go back to James and look at, at verse 17. Um, if you, actually, let's, let's go with 15. We'll get the whole context here. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice, which I think we could say is probably true of most of our political system and our media. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. It's, there are several things I, I want to note about this. First of all, the wisdom that comes from, a, from, from below is easy. I mean, we can do that. That just comes naturally. Ambition, selfish ambition, jealousy. But the wisdom from above is first and foremost, it's a gift. It's a gift from God. If God is the, all, is the all-knowing, is, if God's the all-wise, then, then we only have wisdom in as much as we receive it from Him. But it strikes me also that we know if we're actually living in heavenly wisdom by the fruits. You'll know them by their fruits. Um, we think often of the fruits of the Spirit. This is the fruits of, the wi of, of wisdom. And so I think, I think a good kind of question to ask yourself 
is when you consume the news, do you, is it producing in you purity? Uh, this, this begins with purity. Is it, is it producing in you peace, peaceableness, that you want peace? Gentleness. Are you more gentle after you watch or listen to the news? Does it, does it produce, are you more reasonable? Are you more open to reason? I, I just find it so striking that, that we don't usually think about reasonableness as, as a fruit of the spirit, but, but to be able to be reasoned, to, to, I think our, our secular culture calls us open-minded. I think I like this way better, open to reason, that we, that, that we realize that we might be wrong about something and that we need our brother and sister to help us. That's called, that's, that's humility. To be open to reason is, is be humble. Full of mercy. Are we more compassionate on people after we finish the media, finish consuming media? Um, are, are we impartial? That's a striking word. That too is a gift from God. Impartiality, which we just talked about in James two, two weeks ago in our sermon. That impartiality is a gift from God. Are we sincere? I, I, I worry that if you're anything like me, the news actually has a, a very a very different response in me. I, I think that that I come out thinking about there's all sorts of impurity that I that 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 comes. There's all sorts of I don't want peace. I actually want more conflict. Um, I think I don't come out of, of it gentle. I come out anxious or disturbed. Um, I come out of the news worried which I think the news tries to do. The news actually tries to cultivate that fear. Um, the news always has an enemy. There's always an enemy uh, that they're trying to point to and, and get you to, to worry about. Uh, if you're on the left, it's Donald Trump. He is the enemy. If you're on the right, it's the socialists and the, the, the anarchists who are going to overthrow our democracy. Um, uh, I, I think the, the open to reason Open to reason. Do I come out of the news more open, or do I come actually just with the same biases that I had going in? So, so I just think I think that this James gives us an excellent criteria of what are the things that it looks like for us to do this. One of the things in, in my life, um, I I I got a news subscription, and so I started reading the news every morning, and I found in myself, I found that I actually would read the news over reading my Bible. Like, I'd, if I didn't have enough time to read both, I would read the news. Um, and it kind of made me feel important to know kind of what's happening in the world. Um, and then I, I had this kind of conversion moment where I realized, uh, someone, someone had sent me something of, like, I realized just how fallible the news is, and I'd been misled in something. And I, and I just had this moment of like, oh, wow. I also found myself being less charitable to those who don't agree with me politically. And so I decided to fast from the news. And I've been fasting from the news for a month now. And it's been fantastic. Now, I, I still know what's happening. I still know what's happening in the world because you can't not. But, but the kind of dwelling, the meditation, the, like that's not there. And I think, I, just, I mean, life is short. Time is short. There are so many other things I'd rather be meditating on. And, um, so I think, I think that's just my, in the words of Trinity, this is what the Lord has done in me, uh, kind of, kind of thing there for, for that testimony. But. I have a couple more questions before we begin to move towards breakout groups. Jesse, earlier this evening, you talked about um, this temptation towards omniscience or mm -hmm. some attempt at that illusion of omniscience. And... I imagine for some of us, we might feel this internal battle between um, wanting to be wise and wanting to have that earthly wisdom that comes from above as opposed to just being um, informed in, in only earthly ways, but also feeling this real drive towards doing as much as is possible for the Lord's kingdom work, to being as effective as possible. Mm -hmm. For anyone who's feeling this tension, particularly as you talk about a media fast, 
Um, perhaps if someone is considering that their media diet might be slightly biased and their thought might be, I need to consume more media in order to be better informed as well as as wise as possible. How would you speak to someone feeling that tension where um, they're considering what it means to try to be an effective citizen yeah. with his or her vote as far reaching as possible? Yeah. You know, I. <sighs> I want to I want to get at that question in several several ways, pretty quickly. Um, I I think there there are certain vocations in which like you they're very dependent on the news, uh, very dependent on the news. But I I think giving the news its proper due is I I I think that's important. One of the things I as a historian I think one thing that the news doesn't have is perspective. They're trying to, the reason why 24 seven news, like they're trying to give you analysis, they say history as it's happening. But that's never how history happens. Like, like there's no reflection. There's no, I think the people that I know that are actually wisest and most, they're thriving in their vocations are not those that are hooked into the news. There are those that are actually have read widely, have read, have been thoughtful. I've read books instead of articles. Like, I think I think we we have this kind of instant gratification culture of I want to know what's happening right now. Um, when actually wisdom is taking the long view. Wisdom is let let me think about this for a while. Let me meditate on this. And so I think I would encourage people. I mean, to to think more through like to read a book rather than read an article. To 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 read an opinion. Uh, to, to read a deeper analysis and just getting the, the, the 30 second sound bit, which, which can't possibly give you the context or the meaning of that. Uh, so I think, I think being careful to know, um, I, I feel like we're, the news like makes you know more and more about less and less. You just have a headline, but there's, how did that, what is the meaning of that? You need, you need some reflection, and especially as a Christian. What is this, the meaning of this actually is in, is in, is in the Lord. Uh, he alone holds that. So I think it's very important to keep that, to keep that tension. Um, I do think it's also important to, that we do this in community. So I think I, I'm more, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't want to advise someone necessarily to just, if they're, if they're listening to one bias, to just kind of start consuming other biases. But I think striking up a conversation, like I think this is best, is best done in community. Someone who, who does have a different perspective from you? I think that's really helpful to have that for it to be relational. That's a very practical suggestion. Meaning, go to someone within your community, a, a trusted friend, but perhaps someone who you assume rightly that doesn't share all of your own views politically, and have a conversation. Yeah. Um, are there any other? Um, practical suggestions that you have in terms of either how we can sort of self-diagnose um, whether we are James three sort of media readers, other yeah. ways that you would encourage us to be in community in that way. Well, that's why we're actually going to have these, this, we're going to continue to talk about this in small groups is because I, I think that is such a chief, a chief way to do that. I do, I do again, I think it's important to have these kind of more macro thoughts about what, what is the culture that we live in and what is wisdom. I think the social dilemma, this documentary that I, I recommended, again, is a good, that's a good homework, practical, like how, how am I clicking on my phone all the time? Um, and I, and I, think, I think also if you're meditating, if you find yourself meditating on the news, then I think a really good discipline is actually how about you replace that with a verse? Um, that, that, that would probably be far better for you if you're meditating on scripture than it would be on, on some sort of headline or fear.